Hi, and welcome back to Mysteries Channel. Thanks for clicking on my video. Today, I'm gonna go over a story that I couldn't really find any information besides what I found on Gutenberg.org. It's a wonderful website if you are ever into reading stuff for free. Check it out. I'll put a link to this actual book that I'm referencing in the description box. The book that I was reading is called The Mythology of All Races. I wasn't reading the entire book. I was really on volume 11, which is the Latin American mythology. This book was written by Hartley Burr Alexander. He had a PhD and was a professor of philosophy at the University of Nebraska. This book was published in 1916, and I came across it while trying to find the oldest versions of mythology in the Americas and trying to make connections between the myth being spoken to the actual event that it's recording because I feel like two things happen when these old stories are recounted in most of them. Most of the time, two things are happening and those two things are a historical event is being recorded and the second thing is a lesson is being learned. And this is one of those typical myths. The myth that I'm going over today is from the Carib people. The Carib people are American, Native American people who inhabited the Lesser Antilles and parts of the neighboring South American coast at the time of the Spanish conquest. Their name was given to the Caribbean Sea and its Arawakan equivalent is the origin of the English word cannibal. And we all know why that is. The Carib people were basically point zero for the catastrophe that is the Spanish conquest of the Americas. So within just one to two generations, they were almost completely wiped off the face of the earth. When I went online to look up other accounts of the story, everything was in a different language. So I really can't check this against anything else written. So that being said, there's one last disclaimer, and that is I'm going to be reading directly from the book. And this is in the author's words. Immediately within the first two sentences, you will see that he is making connections between what is said and his own religious upbringing. Um, so don't think that I am inferring this on my own. Last thing, these are all things I'm reading about and because I'm reading it, I really don't know anything but what I'm reading. That is why I'm gonna butcher any name that is mentioned in this book. Unfortunately, I don't know how to say it. I looked for other videos that talked about this tale at all just so I could hear somebody else say the names and they don't exist, they don't exist. So I apologize in advance for the butchering of every name in this in this tale. Not many primitive legends are more dramatically vivid than the Carib story of Makinaru and Anuatu. And few myths give wider insight into the ideas and customs of a people. The theme of the tale is very clearly the coming of evil as the consequence of woman's deed. Although the motive of her action is not mere curiosity as in the tale of Pandora, but a more potent passion of revenge, or rather that of vengeful retribution, which is the primitive image of justice. In an intimate fashion too, the story gives to the spirit Kanaima at work, while its denouncements suggest that the restless Orehu, the woman of the waters, may be none other than the, the authoress of evil and the liberator of ills. In a time long past, so long past that even the grandmothers of our grandmothers were not yet born, the Caribs of Suriname say the world was quite other than what it is today. The trees were forever in fruit, the animals lived in perfect harmony, and the little Akuti played fearlessly with the beard of the jaguar, and the serpents had no venom. The rivers flowed evenly without drought or flood, and even the waters of the Cascades gently glided down from the high peaks. No human creature has yet come to life, and Adelhi, whom now we invoke as God, but who then was called the sun, was troubled. He descended from the skies, and shortly after man was born from the Cayman, born, men and women in two sexes. The female were all of ravishing beauty, but many of the males had repellent features, and this was the cause of their dispersion. Since the men of fair visage, unable to endure dwelling with the ugly fellows separated from them going west, while the hideous men went to the east, each party taking the wives whom they had chosen. Now in the tribe of the handsome Indians lived a certain young man, Makanura, and his aged mother. The youth was altogether charming, tall and graceful, with no equal in hunting and fishing. While all the men brought their baskets to him for the final touch, nor was his mother less skilled in the making of hammocks, preparation of cassava, or brewing of tapana. They lived in harmony with one another and with all their tribe, 
suffering neither from excessive heat nor from foggy chill, free from evil beasts, and none existed in that region. One day, however, Makanura found his basket net broken and his fish devoured, a thing such as never happened in the history of the tribe. And so he placed a woodpecker on guard when next he set his trap. But though he ran with all haste when he heard the talk talk, the signal, he came too late. Again, the fish were devoured and the net was broken. With Cuckoo as guard, he fared better. For when he heard the pon pon, which was his bird's signal, he arrived in time to set the arrow between the ugly eyes of a caiman, which disappeared beneath the water with a glu glu. <laughs> Makanora repaired his basket net and departed, only to hear again the signal, pon pon. Returning, he found a beautiful Indian woman in tears. Who are you, he said. Anuaitu, she replied. Whence came you? From far, far. Who are your kindred? Oh, ask me that not, as she covered her face with her hands. The maiden was little more than a child, lived with Makanora and his mother, and as she grew, she increased in beauty, so that Makanora decided to wed her. At first she refused with tears, but finally she consented, though the union lacked correctness and that Makanora had not secured the consent of her parents, whose names she still refused to divulge. For a while, the married pair lived happily until Ainuatu was seized with a great desire to visit her mother. But when Makanora would go with her, she, in terror, urged the abandonment of the trip, only to find her husband so determined that he said, Then I will go alone to ask you in marriage of your kin. Never, never that, cried Ainuatu. That would be to destroy us all us two and your dear mother. But Makanora was not to be dissuaded, for he had a consulted a pieman who had assured him that he would return safely, and so he set forth with his bride. After several weeks, their canoe reached an encampment, and Ainuatu said, We are arrived. I will go in search of my mother. She will bring you a gourd filled with blood and raw meat and another with military, a fermented liquor, and cassava bread. Our lot depends on your choice. The young man, when his mother-in-law appeared, unhesitantly took the Beltarian bread, whereupon the old woman has said, you have chosen well. I give my consent to your marriage, but I fear that my husband will oppose it strongly. Kaikuchi, Jaguar, was the husband's name. The two women went in advance to test his temper toward Makanura's suit, but his rage was great, and it was necessary to hide the youth in the forest until, at last, Kaikuji was mollified to such a degree that he consented to see the young man, only to have his anger roused again at the sight, so that he cried, How dare you approach me? Makanura responded, True, my marriage with your daughter is not according to the rites, but... I am come to make reparation. I will make for you whatever you desire. Make me then a hala, a sorcerer's stool, with the head of a jaguar on one side and, the, and my portrait on the other. By midnight, Makanora had completed the work except for the portrait. But here there was a difficulty, for Kaikuchi kept his head covered with a calabash. The covering pierced only with eye holes, and when Makanora asked his wife to describe her parents, she replied, impossible. My father is a pieman. He knows all. He would kill us both. Makanora concealed himself near the hammock of his father-in-law in hopes of seeing his face. At first, a louse, then a spider came to annoy Kaikuji, who killed them both without showing his visage. Finally, however, an army of ants attacked him ferociously, and the pieman, rising up in consternation, revealed himself, his whole horrible head. Makanora appeared with the hella completed when morning came. That will not suffice, said Kaikuji. In a single night, you must make for me a lodge formed entirely of the most beautiful feathers. The young man felt himself lost, but multitudes of hummingbirds and jacamars and other brilliant plumage cast their feathers down to him so that the lodge was finished before daybreak, whereupon Nakamura was received as the recognized husband of Anuitu. The time soon came, however, when he wished again to see his mother. But as Kaikuchi refused to allow his daughter to accompany the youth, he set forth alone. Happy days were spent at home. He telling his adventures, the mother recounting of the tales of long ago, which had been dimly returning to her troubled memory. And when Makanura would return to his wife, the old mother begged him to stay, while the pine man warned him of danger. But he was resolved and parted once more, telling his mother that he would send her each day a bird to apprise her of his condition. If the owl came, she would know him lost. Arrived at the home of Ainuatu, he was met by his wife, 
mother-in-law in tears with a warning. Away, quickly, Kaikuji is furious at the news he has received. Nevertheless, Makanura went on, and at the threshold of the lodge was met by Kaikuji, who, felling him with a blow, thrust an arrow between his eyes. Meanwhile, Makanura's mother had been hearing daily the mournful Batua Batua of the Olaten, but one day it was succeeded by the dismal Popopu of the owl. <laughs> And knowing that her son was dead, she led the bird of ill tidings, found first the young man's canoe and then his hidden body, with which she returned sadly to her people. The men covered the corpse with a pall of beautiful feathers, placing about it Makanora's arms and utensils. The woman prepared the tapana for the funeral feast, and all assembled to hear the funeral chant, the last farewell of mother to son. She recounted the tragic tale of his love and death, and then, raising the cup of tapana to her lips, she cried, Who who has extinguished the light of my son? Who has sent him into the valley of shades? Woe, woe to him. Alas, you see in me, O oh friends and brothers, only a poor weak woman. I can do nothing. Who of you will avenge me? Forthwith, two men sprang forward, seized the cup, emptied it. Beside the corpse, they atoned the Kaima song, dancing the dance of vengeance, and into one of them the soul of a boa constrictor entered, and into the other one that of a jaguar. The great feast of, of Tapana was held in the village of Kaikuji, where hundreds of natives were already gathered, men, women, and children. They drank and vomited, drank and vomited, and again. Finally, till all were drunken, two men came, one in the hide of a jaguar, the other in the molten scales of a boa constrictor. In the instant, Kaikuji and all that were about him were struck down, some crushed by the jaguar's blows, others strangled by the snaky folds. Nevertheless, fear had rescued some from their drunkenness, and they seized their bows and threatened the assailants with hundreds of arrows, whereupon the two Kayamas ceased their attack. While one of them cried, Hold, friends, we are in your hands, but let us first speak. Then he recounted the tale of Makanora. And when he had ceased, an old Piaman advanced, saying, Young man, you have spoken well. We receive you as friends. The feast was renewed more heartily than ever. But though Ainuatu in her grief had remained away, she now advanced, searching among the corpses. She examined them one by one with dry eyes. But at last she paused beside a body, her eyes filled with tears. And seating herself, long, long, she chanted plaintively the phrases of the dead. Suddenly she leapt up, her hair bristling with her face on fire, and in a vibrant voice, intoning the terrible Kanaima. And as she danced, the soul of a rattlesnake entered her. Meanwhile, in the other village, people were celebrating the Tapana, delirious with joy for the vengeance taken, while the mother of Makanura, overcome by drink, lay in her hammock, dreaming of her son. Ainuatu entered, possessed, but she drew back when she heard her name pronounced by the dreaming woman. Ainuatu, my child, you are good, as was also your mother, but why come you hither? My son, whom you have lost, is no more. Oh my Makanura, rejoice! Thou art happy now, for thou art avenged in the blood of thine murderers. Ah, yes! They are well avenged. During this, Ainuatu felt in her soul a dread conflict, the call of love struggling with that of the call of duty. But at the words avenged in blood, she restrained herself no longer. Though throwing herself upon the woman, she drew her tongue from her mouth, striking with venomous poison and leaning over her agonizing victim, she spoke. The caiman which your son killed beside the basket net was my brother. Like my father, he had a caiman's head. I would pardon that. My father avenged his son's death in inflicting on yours the same done that he had dealt, an arrow between the eyes. Your kindred had slain my father and all of mine. I would have pardoned that too had they spared my mother. Makanura is the cause of what is most dear to me in the world has perished. In robbing him in my turn, I emulate what he held most precious. Uttering a terrible cry, she fled into the forest, and at the sound, a change unprecedented occurred throughout all nature. The winds responded with a tempest which struck down the trees and uprooted the very oaks. Thick clouds veiled the face of Adehi, while a sinister lightning and the roar of thunder filled the world. A deluge of rain mingled with the floods of rivers. The animals, until then peaceable, fell upon and devoured one another. The serpent struck with his venom. The caiman made his terrible jaws to crush. The jaguar tore flesh from the harmless agouti. Ainuatu, followed by the savage host of the forest, pursued her course until she arrived at the summit of an enormous rock, whence gushed a cascade. And there, on the brink of the precipice, she stretched forth her arms, leaned forward, and plunged into the depths. 
The waters received her and closed over her. Not was to be seen, but a terrifying whirlpool. If today some stranger passed beside a certain cascade, the Carib native will warn him not to speak its name. It would be his infallible death. For at the bottom of these waters, Makanora and Ainuatu dwell together in the marvelous palace of her who is the soul of the waters. And that is the legend. Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of things the very in the very beginning the author says that this is a tale recounting clearly is the coming of evil as a consequence of a woman's deed kind of hard and far-fetched the the original deed that was committed was him killing of a caiman i mean honestly if you really want to look at it it begins with the brother stealing fish from him and then revenge is sought over and over again to no end so the author of course i think he is trying to tie this to an adam and eve story and um really i think the main part of this is to teach the lesson that revenge only begets revenge because it starts with the brother eating fish makanura killing the brother and then it goes on and on and on until the end of it at the same time they're talking about how the earth was once different there were no seasons there was calm flowing waters there was peace on earth, right? It was warm and it was calm and it was peaceful. And then all of a sudden something changed, possibly an interglacial period. Remember the video I just did? And it just makes me wonder, in a world long ago, when there were few people walking upon it, what would possess you to keep going? To wander and wander and wander until finally all corners of the earth are filled. And I think that it had to be huge climatic events, cataclysms in their own right. If you lived on a peaceful earth that had no wind and was warm all the time, it was a constant temperature where the fruit was always on the trees, and all of a sudden that changes. There are dry spells and there are cold spells and there are periods of months where there is no fruit. That's a huge event that marks a new beginning to a new history of the world. And I think that this is one of those tales that marks that event. Anyway, tell me what you think below. Had you heard of this tale? If you are the Caribbean area, please shoot me a message and tell me how bad I jacked these names up. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and you guys have yourselves a very great day.